Hey, Spring Harvest, it's Patrick Regan, and uh, we're continuing together our Honesty Over Silence stream. And uh, in the previous session, we looked at tackling anxiety, and uh, this session, we're going to look at tackling depression. And uh, I'd really encourage you to look at this with two hats, really. N uh, number one is obviously these issues around anxiety, depression, perfectionism are affecting so many people now. Even if you didn't struggle with anxiety beforehand, we can just see how everyone started panic buying and all that happens is affecting people in a massive way. Um, but secondly, if you you know, don't struggle with it yourself, try and understand it so you can help someone that is. And uh, it could be really, really important in these uh, next couple of months. And uh, so we really want to help grapple with this um, today. Um, I mentioned yesterday that most of the teaching has come from a um, book called Honesty Over Silence and uh, When Faith Gets Shaken. And uh, you can get these from the Kintsugi Hope website. I'm sure that there are other bookshops, websites as well. And uh, we're doing it at half price just because the themes in these books are so relevant for today. Um, we didn't want to uh, make money out of people's tragedy, if that makes sense. Um, we wanted people to have them um, at cost price. So please check them out and get them from our website um, if uh, you're interested. Um, the other thing I didn't mention the other day is um, we have a friend who's an acoustic artist and, uh, and she has designed loads of these Kintsugi uh, pendants. Um, every single one's bespoke, every single one's handmade. Again, they may be a lovely gift for someone who's going through a tough time. You know, if someone's going through a tough time, they don't really want sympathy cards. But to say that I'm standing there in your brokenness and uh, I'm there and God will create something beautiful out of this mess um, could be a really powerful thing to do. So they're on our website as well. So depression, what does it feel like? I guess if there was an audience here, we'd probably get into groups and we'd discuss it. And we'd get so many different things back because it, it can feel quite different to different people. But I want you to watch this video now. You, you may have seen it before. It's a very common video. It's um, used by the NHS a lot. Um, looking at depression and uh, describing it as a black dog. But um, the thing I like about the video is it finishes with a bit of hope. It gives us some tools and techniques to be able to deal with depression as well. So just check this video out now. I had a black dog. His name was Depression. Whenever the black dog made an appearance, I felt empty and life just seemed to slow down. He could surprise me with a visit for no reason or occasion. The black dog made me look and feel older than my years. When the rest of the world seemed to be enjoying life, I could only see it through the black dog. Activities that usually brought me pleasure suddenly ceased to. He liked to ruin my appetite. He chewed up my memory and my ability to concentrate. Doing anything or going anywhere with the black dog required superhuman strength. At social occasions, he'd sniff out what confidence I had and chase it away. My biggest fear was being found out. I worried that people would judge me. Because of the shame and stigma of the black dog, I was constantly worried that I'd be found out. So I invested vast amounts of energy into covering him up. Keeping up an emotional lie is exhausting. Black dog could make me think and say negative things. He could make me irritable and difficult to be around. He would take my love and bury my intimacy. He loved nothing more than to wake me up with highly repetitive and negative thinking. He also liked to remind me how exhausted I was going to be the next day. Having a black dog in your life isn't so much about feeling a bit down, sad or blue. At its worst, it's about being devoid of feeling altogether. As I got older, the black dog got bigger and he started hanging around all the time. I'd chase him off with whatever I thought might send him running. But more often than not, he'd come out on top. Going down became easier than getting up again. So I became rather good at self-medication, which never really helped. Eventually, I felt totally isolated from everything and everyone. The black dog had finally succeeded in hijacking my life. 
When you lose all joy in life, you can begin to question what the point of it is. Thankfully, this was the time that I sought professional help. This was my first step towards recovery and a major turning point in my life. I learned that it doesn't matter who you are, the black dog affects millions and millions of people. It is an equal opportunity mongrel. I also learned that there was no silver bullet or magic pill. Medication can help some and others might need a different approach altogether. I also learned that being emotionally genuine and authentic to those who are close to you can be an absolute game changer. Most importantly, I learned not to be afraid of the black dog and I taught him a few new tricks of my own. The more tired and stressed you are, the louder he barks. So it's important to learn how to quiet your mind. It's been clinically proven that regular exercise can be as effective for treating mild to moderate depression as antidepressants. So go for a walk or a run and leave the mutt behind. Keep a mood journal. Getting your thoughts on paper can be cathartic and often insightful. Also keep track of the things that you have to be grateful for. The most important thing to remember is that no matter how bad it gets, if you take the right steps, talk to the right people, black dog days can and will pass. I wouldn't say that I'm grateful for the black dog, but he's been an incredible teacher. He forced me to re-evaluate and simplify my life. I learnt that rather than running away from my problems, it's better to embrace them. The black dog may always be part of my life, but he'll never be the beast that he was. We have an understanding. I've learned through knowledge, patience, discipline and humour, the worst black dog can be made to heal. If you're in difficulty, never be afraid to ask for help. There is absolutely no shame in doing so. The only shame is missing out on life. A poem by Emily Lloyd. When depression hits, it arrived unexpectedly. No bad weather warning. No announcement. Today, ma'am, you will experience severe turbulence in your emotions. Aircraft crew are struggling to overcome the problem and resume normal function. You see, there is a massive difference between having a down day and depression. Because what depression can do is it can steal your confidence. And the challenge is actually, if you read all the books, and you know, I, I often recommend an insight book by CWR on depression. Um, it's a really brilliant book, and a lot of the material from today is from that book. But if you read all the books, all the experts, they say, you know what? It's really hard to pin down what causes depression. Um, Dr. Grace Ketterman suggests these influences. Um, there's four of them. Uh, genetic uh, predisposition, family practices and beliefs, impact and environment, and stress. I know for me personally, I've always had that sort of personality where I'm definitely um, a glass is half empty type personality. My wife is the opposite, drives me mad. Um, she is glass always half full, but to be honest with you, with the whole coronavirus, um, she hasn't been like that. She's been like, this is, this is tough, this is hard. And, uh, and I think going through that, you know, I felt like I just needed to soldier on. And, uh, and I just needed to look on the upside and be optimistic and positive about everything. And it's been really interesting watching people's reactions to the coronavirus online. It seems to be very extreme reactions. One has been one of, wow, you know, we can reimagine church. We can do this. We can do that. The church was never about a building, which, you know, there's an element of truth in that. You know, and I think that is an interesting reaction. Another reaction is like it's Armageddon. It's the end of the world. It's a horror movie. Um, this is really, really difficult. And uh, and of course, there is truth in that as well. It is really difficult. But I realised for me, getting over my depression, the first key to freedom was acceptance, and uh, was realising that, that you know what, you cannot deny what is happening. And there's this really interesting um, research that has been done by Harvard, and they did it about how you survive a concentration camp. Now, I am not comparing what we're going through to a concentration camp. Please hear me. But the results are fascinating. They said the guys who showed optimism going into the concentration camps actually died quite quickly. You know, they were the ones who were going, we're going to get through this in a couple of weeks. It's all going to be OK. The ones that did really, really well were the ones that accepted the reality of the situation, but adapted to it. 
that change, that almost found meaning and purpose in it. Whether that was um, trying to play instruments, was finding wire in the yard, whether it was um, realizing what was going on and uh, then realizing that that doesn't have to be disaster, though it is really, 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 really hard. They found a way through and they were the guys that survived. And you know, for me, sometimes I just felt like I just need to soldier on. You know, people used to say to me, the devil can knock you down, but he can't knock you out. Which again is an element of truth. But I think for me is the guilt that came with that then was, was unbearable. You know, I always talk about the shoulds, the must, I oughts. I should be able to cope with this. What's wrong with me? I must pull myself together. I'm letting everyone down. I ought to be stronger. Get a grip. So for me, you know, I did all the things that I read on the websites about depression and on that video. I, I used to go to the gym more. I forced myself to go to the gym more. I walked the dog more. I read self-help books. I'd go to church um, more, but I would just feel incredibly lonely. I remember singing this one song and uh, it was about taking the land and we're an army of God and we're gonna take this land and that land and we've got this victory and we're gonna break this chain and we're gonna do this. And uh, everyone was really, really up for it, really, really going for it. And I looked down and my wife's on the phone. Now the challenge with you know, being at church with your parent, normally what happens is your kids are on their phone and it's a bit embarrassing. And particularly in my church, you know, people might, oh, oh, Patrick Regan's kids are not paying attention and all that sort of stuff. And so normally, particularly Daniel, he's 14, I'm like, get off your phone, unless he's watching the football or he can then tell me the score. Get off, tell me the score, then get off your phone. But my wife's on the phone, this is really, really embarrassing. And uh, I was going, get up, I've got to sing about being in an army. And she just looked at me and she went, I'm knackered, I don't want to be in an army. And you know, so often, the way we talk about these things is actually makes people worse. I know for me, I had to accept that depression was something that I was really struggling with. And, uh, and what helped me actually, there was this uh, blog that I read from Blurt, which is a brilliant organization. And it talked about the 10 lies that depression tells us. Um, depression tries to convince us that we're not really ill. Depression tells us that everything is our fault. Depression tells us that nobody cares about us or likes us. Depression tells us we're not good enough. Depression tells us that we don't deserve things. Depression tells us we're a bad person. Depression tells us to be quiet. Depression tells us that we're a burden. Depression tells us that we don't deserve help and support. Depression tells us there is no help. And you know, I think we've got to be really careful here because actually, you know, again, I want to uh, underline that actually having a sad time and a sad day is very different to depression. And actually talking to your GP, talking to experts about some of this is so important. I remember I was actually doing a talk at Spring Harvest and this woman came up to me and uh, she said, um, you know what, I've been crying every day for months and I think I'm struggling with depression. But I went up to my pastor and I told him this, and my pastor said, I hear no faith in your comments whatsoever. And she looked at me and I went, um, you know what, I am not an expert, I'm not a medical profession, I can't uh, tell you what's going on, but maybe you need to think about going to your GP. And she looked at me as if I was saying something really radical. And she's going, really? And I was going, yeah, because you know what? is they may be able to give you something to help. And, you know, and I'm not someone saying that medication is the answer to everything, but actually that sometimes it's important. Uh, sometimes it's hard to get right, to be honest, but sometimes there's other things that can help as well. But you will not get help if you don't admit what is there. And I think that's really, really important. The other thing that really helped me was really, and again, a bit like we talked about anxiety, is that um, anxiety and depression are not weaknesses. There is a brilliant book called Clinical Depression, The Curse of the Strong. The psychiatrist who wrote it said nine times out of 10, he can tell the personal characteristics of someone that's suffering depression. And they're these, moral strength, reliability, diligence, strong conscience, a strong sense of responsibility, a tendency to focus on the needs of others before one's own, sensitivity, vulnerable to criticism, self-esteem dependent on the evaluation of others. People that struggled with this, Oliver Cromwell, Abraham Lincoln, Vincent van Gogh, Winston Churchill, none of these people got better by other people telling them to pull themselves together and try a little bit harder. Not weak people. 
You know, very famously, Rick and Kay Warren lost their son who completed a suicide at the age of 27. He suffered from severe depression and yet they didn't see him as weak as having depression. Um, they actually saw him as strong as having to live under depression, a cloud of depression for 27 years. Uh, I love this quote from Quay, Kay Warren. It says this, some of the most courageous people are the ones that live with strong depression. Since his death, I hear from many depressed Christians and many feel ashamed because they come to church and the church tells them to pray a bit more, read their Bibles a bit more, or they have a sin to confess. When we do that, their suffering is minimized. The church needs to recognize the value of people with mental illness, what they bring, what they teach us about walking with God when it doesn't even feel good. There's a quote from um, the CWR Insight book, and again, I found this incredibly helpful. I'm a bit of a sensitive soul, and, uh, and again, I always thought that was a weakness, and, uh, and this really, really helped me. It says this, having a sensitive character or spirit which readily responds to the needs of others is a wonderful gift. But the flip side is that we are vulnerable to thoughtlessness, rudeness, spite, and bad temper of others. It isn't enough to toughen up, develop a thicker skin. Criticism can hurt and hurt deeply. We may feel trampled on, wounded and rejected. If that hurt remains unhealed and barely hidden, or if it is invertedly touched upon, it can lead to depression. You know, um, I started thinking about how do I get out of this place that I was in and uh, the only way that I could describe it is, um, well my friend described it like this, um, his name's John Sutherland, he's written a book on it, he's an amazing guy, he used to be a police officer. Um, in fact, he tells his story in Honesty Over Silence um, and he said like, if you imagine a cat and the cat is in a bath, there's no water, don't worry, but the cat is scrambling to get out and it just can't. And the look of fear in the cat's eyes is overwhelming. And, uh, and as I started to realize, how do I get out of this place? I started to um, read some of the insight books and some of the other stuff and, and really started to pray. And I realized that if you're going to climb out of a hole, um, you know, J.K. Rowling said this, rock bottom became the solid foundation on which I rebuilt my life is if you're going to climb, if you feel like you hit rock bottom, the way to climb successfully is not to be weighed down, um, is to travel light. And uh, I don't know about you, before we go on holiday, me and my family always have this debate about what we can take. And I'm always the one who's getting stressed around, have we got too much luggage? I dread getting to the airport. And when you put the bag on the scale and the person goes, you know what, I'm sorry, sir, you're overweight. Um, you're gonna have to give us like 400 pounds or something. You know, it's my, my worst fear. So I'm constantly checking the scales. And, uh, and I'm trying to work out what are those things that I need to let go of in my life and, uh, and try and get rid of. So I've got a few bags here that I tend to carry around. Now, I hope this is going to work. And uh, so this is my first bag. And unfortunately, I haven't been able to go shopping for obvious reasons to fill these bags up. Um, but here's my first bag. And this is my bag of really high standards. I will never be good enough. And tomorrow we're going to talk about perfectionism. And, uh, and again, that's such a big issue for this time, isn't it? Um, here's another bag. And I probably shouldn't put this over my microphone, but there you go. Um, here's another bag. And this bag is my fear of rejection. I'll put that around my arm here. So I'm going to carry that. This is my bag. People will never like me. I carry rejection around. Um, my self-esteem definitely needs restoration. And here's my other bag. That, um, this is my protection against disappointment. Um, this is the one, I don't know if you're anything like me, I don't want to get my hopes up because I don't want to be disappointed. And so, you know, but living without hopes really, really hard. And, uh, and I wonder how I can renew my thinking, and we'll come on to that a bit later. Um, so I have this bag, oh my goodness, I'm getting covered in bags. Um, this bag is my problems bigger than anyone else's, thank you very much. And, uh, and again, you know, in this culture with the coronavirus, it's so easy to compare, isn't it, on social media. Um, you know, I've seen people who are struggling to have kids going, please stop going on about how your children is really hard to homeschool them. We would love to be able in that situation. You've got parents with special needs going, well, I'm, it's doing my head in. You've got people who are on their own. There is no win in comparison. Everyone is dealing with this 
differently. And so we need to stop that and realize that everyone is going through a tough time. Some people, I've got a friend who's actually enjoying it, um, not enjoying what's happening to the community around him, but is enjoying the peace and quiet. So it's like, we've got to realize it's different for different people. If I had another bag, this bag could be suffering is my friend. Um, some people say, you know, the Christian walk is meant to be about suffering. Yeah. Uh, I get that, but it's also meant to be about freedom and knowing that you're loved and enjoyed by God. Um, in this bag, it might be, you know, it's just too painful and I can't look. And I, again, I know um, I lost my brother at a very young age and that has been a long time of healing and process. And for years, I just didn't want to go there. And that was okay because God doesn't force us to do stuff before we're ready. Um, another bag could be, you know what, it's safer in the hole. Like a prisoner who's been confined for years, actually when you start to deal with stuff, there's a panic. And, uh, but I realized for me that I needed to climb and I needed to let go of some of those bags in order to get out. And uh, I started to climb and I started, because you know what, I need to let go of those emotions that were more fear-based. Anxiety, worry, resentment, frustration, impatience, annoyance, hate, anger, rage, resentment. These emotions result in a state of mind that creates a reaction in our body. I long for those um, faith-based emotions. In Galatians 5, verse 21, it talks about love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. But we are what? We shouldn't feel guilty for the emotions that we're feeling. Suppressing them is not going to help. Accepting them is the first part of the climb. So if you went on any well-being course, and uh, we're going to have a live chat as well at some point, hopefully, um, you will find that there are five ways to well-being that everyone talks about. Uh, number one is connect. Number two is be active. Number three is take notice. Number four is keep learning. And number five is give. And actually, that's a really important list. If you look at that list again, it's really important, isn't it? We need to connect through social media, unfortunately, or online. Um, there, you know, we haven't got many options, but we need to connect. We need to keep active. But the one that I really want to look at is this whole thing about taking notice. Um, and I think what I want to say about this is about taking notice of what you're thinking about. And because uh, I think actually this is one of the biggest issues. And I said yesterday, instead of trying to boil the ocean, I wanted to try and look at one thing and look at one thing really, really well. And I think this whole area of negative thoughts is huge. Um, because negative thoughts will come. You know, we only have to watch the news. And there's so much negativity because it is a really tough time. Um, I have to admit there's some news channels that are probably uh, better than others to watch. Uh, I'm going to delete one off my um, uh, iPhone because the headlines are so sensational the whole time. It's doing my head in. Um, but we need to watch some of the news to be informed. But my friend, um, I think, has this really wise way of looking at thoughts. He talks about the um, verse in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, I'm sure you're aware of it, that talks about taking captive every thought. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 5, that we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. And, uh, and so often that we think that taking captive every thought is as soon as a bad thought comes into our head, we bash it in the name of Jesus. <laughs> you know? And... Uh, and he was like, if you imagine your thoughts as trains coming into a train station, maybe this train station is the circumstances in your life. And every time a negative thought comes into your life, you turn to that train and you go, in the name of Jesus, you will not come into the train station. The train's going to turn up, trust me. Um, and it's just going to keep coming. And we know whatever we resist persists. Uh, Carl Jung, the famous psychologist, said that actually. And uh, so he was saying, how do we deal with this in a different way? So he said that maybe actually the more helpful way, the way of taking captive every thought is when a train comes in, is deciding whether you're going to get on the train or not. Is a, maybe it's actually going, you know what? I'm going to step away. I'm going to say, is that thought true? Is that what God says about me? Is that what my friends say about me? Taking captive every thought is questioning the thought and realizing that most of the really negative thoughts that we have um, aren't true and letting the train go. Letting it go into that dark tunnel. 
And my thing is, like, if you get on that train, try and get off at the next stop. Don't let it take you into a time of complete darkness if you can help it. Get other people around you to talk positive things. And that's why the use of CBT, um, cognitive behavioral therapy, and some of those other strategies are very, very helpful for people. Sometimes labeling the thought. So you recognize, you know, I, I had a, for years, this is my, I'm going to die early of cancer thought. Um, I'm not going to get on that train again. I'm going to try and think. Um, in the CWR Insight series, they had a really helpful list of some common negative thinking. I wonder if you can relate to any of these. Number one, overgeneralization. We make one mistake and assume the entire project will fail. We have difficulty with one person and presume the whole world is against us. All or nothing thinking. We oversimplify what happens to us. We make absolute statements. Blowing things out of proportion. You know, um, often, um, this doesn't happen at the moment because I'm the only one here, but what often happens at the end of my talks is I will always get a loving Christian that will come up to me and they'll say, I want to tell you something in love. When a Christian says to you, I want to tell you something in love, that is normally code for I'm going to destroy you. And I'll go home that night and you know what? The only thing I'll be thinking about wasn't all the amazing things that God did, wasn't all the amazing things that went on um, is the loving Christian. And then I'll blow it out of proportion. By the time I've stopped thinking about it at two in the morning, I've decided to resign and decided I am literally no good at this anymore. I just need to give up. Labeling, I'm useless, I'm no good. Self-blame, everything is my fault. Filtering, we only see our mistakes and weaknesses, not our accomplishments and strengths. Disqualifying, I could have done better. Our event wasn't a sold out. I didn't sell enough books as all the other amazing speakers out there. What's wrong with me? Mind reading, oh my goodness. We believe we know what other people think about us. So I have no idea now because I cannot even get eye contact with you guys. And if you heard me speak, you know, I love uh, getting eye contact and interaction. And uh, I'm just looking at you down the lens of a camera. I have no idea how this is translating. I really hope my heart is that is doing some good. But you know what? So often what we do is we just assume the negative. Oh my goodness, it's not coming across very well. People are going to think I'm an idiot standing on a stage in an empty church with a camera. You know, and you start to mind read and you start to think about what other people are thinking about. Fortune telling. We think we know what the future holds and it's not good. Rigid thinking. We chastise ourselves. I shouldn't be like this. You know, we need to decide that we want to listen to some alternative voices. You know, we need to stop listening to the voice of comparison. We need to stop listening to that. Everyone seems to be handling this better than me. For one of the things that's going on at me at the moment with the coronavirus is the whole thing with parenting my kids. And, uh, you know, Abby is amazing, but she needs special, she has special educational needs. Uh, she has a visual impairment, um, which means she, can't, she just doesn't process things the way other kids process. She can have meltdowns. And I'm just like, I'm the worst parent. Look at all these other people on Facebook. You know, their kids are loving it. And uh, Diane often says to me, I think you're looking at the wrong Facebook pages. <laughs> and, uh, and you can compare. You need to stay in your lane. Um, you know, I do this at conferences. I I'll do this now, to be honest. Is you check the program and you look and see who's on at the same time as you. And uh, who's funnier than you, who's more intelligent than you, who knows the Bible better than you. And then that imposter syndrome, you know, that, that voice that tells you that everything I've ever achieved is a fluke. And uh, one day I'm going to be found out as useless. Um, people will be going to YouTube, they'll be looking at their views, they'll be looking at this, they'll be looking at that. And it, there is no win in comparison. And, uh, and I've really had to check my heart on that a few times, to be honest. And I realized that I've come to the conclusion that God requires my best. It doesn't require perfection. And that my desire is, is to see, you know, if we see uh, some people make a, you know, make a change, make a difference, bring hope, bring love, bring compassion, um, join a Kintsugi group, get hold of something that's going to help them, it's definitely worth it. Um, we get so distracted by stats and success. And a good question is, what is success anyway? Maybe success is living in line with your values. If your value is relationship, then success looks very different. If your success is building an empire, it looks very different um, and building numbers. So we've got to challenge ourselves. We've got to let go of the inner critic. 
You failed again. What's wrong with you? Have flexible goals instead of rigid goals. You know what? We've got a routine in our family to deal with the coronavirus. Um, today, um, I didn't keep to it. And instead of beating myself up, I was exhausted and I knew I had to do this all day. So I was thinking, you know what? I'm actually going to cut myself some slack here. Um, stop listening to the voice that says you're not enough and listen to the voice of what Jesus says to you. We take captive every thought. 2 Corinthians 10 we've already looked at. Taking captive every thought and making it obedient to Christ. We take captive every thought by learning what the word of God says about us. It says, thy word is a lamp unto our feet. Understanding what is God's voice in all this. So here's the thing. If we want to get through some of this stuff, there's five key things that I want us to really think about. Number one, I've said it a number of times, accept the hurt. Accept the fact that anxiety is part of what's going on, but it isn't weakness. Ask the question, does God say this about me? Say sorry, actually, when we have said that we are worthless because it denies God's unconditional love, that that's not what he says about us. Remember, fourthly, that God always forgives. And fifthly, let go of the lies and replace it with truth. I want to finish um, by telling you a story. Um, a number of years ago now, uh, the charity I was working for, we had a visit from Archbishop Desmond Tutu. I hope you caught that name as it dropped there. And I was really, really excited because I had visited, you know, I had lots of uh, visits from prime ministers normally a, a week before the election with 40 cameras and, and all these other people had come to visit the charity before. And, you know, and I, I was polite and I, but Desmond Tutu, I actually really wanted to meet this guy. Uh, I thought he was so inspirational. And, uh, but the challenge was he was coming at 10 o'clock. And at 10 o'clock in the morning, he wanted to meet some of our young people. Now, the young people that we were working with at 10 o'clock in the morning were either in bed or in school. And so I was really nervous no one was going to be there. We had this big double-decker bus that we take onto estates, and he was going to come to visit that bus. So I said to my youth workers, get around the estate and tell them that Desmond Tutu's coming. And so they went around the estate, and they went, look, you've got to get up early. Desmond Tutu's coming. And all our young people were like, ooh. I was like, you're kidding me. And so I, was say, I said to my youth workers, tell them, have they heard of Nelson Mandela? And they're like, have you heard of Nelson Mandela? And they're like, yeah, of course I've heard of Nelson Mandela. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell them, he's the next best thing. He's got bling and everything. You're going to love him. He's brilliant. And, uh, and he was coming with Mary Robinson, the former president of Ireland and human rights commissioner for the UN. But we didn't try to explain who she was. And uh, so all these kids turned up uh, more out of respect um, for, for us than knowing who Desmond Tutu actually was. And, uh, and so they turned up. And you know, um, you'll see a photo of it. You know how Desmond Tutu, um, he's quite a small character, and he's, an, he, you know, he's, he's getting on a bit. Um, he's still got more energy than me probably. But you know, you know how sometimes lovely old people grab your hand and then they don't let go for ages? It was one of those moments. He grabbed my hand. And I'm sort of thinking, I'm not sure what to do now because he ain't letting go. So we walked hand in hand onto the bus. It was great. All my guys were falling about laughing. They were loving it. And we sat there and he started to listen. And I was like, you know, Desmond, you know, I get listening's good, but maybe tell him a few stories about Nelson Mandela, you know, you know. And he listened and he listened. And he listened as kids started talking about struggling to get a job because you have a certain postcode. Seeing their dad beat up their mum and feeling powerless to do anything about it. Listen as talking about friends, neighbours, seeing kids shot and killed, feeling like there's no hope for the future. Talking about temporary dads or guesting dads, dads that have come into their lives just for the last six months. Mum says she's in love and they're having to live with this guy. And you know the reality is across this country there are households now that are so dysfunctional but they're having to stay together and it's really really tough parents working long hours and yet still struggling having responsibility for younger brothers and sisters at the age of like 13 and so Desmond Tutu looked at all these people and at the end he says this what you guys need to know is your past doesn't have to define your future your past doesn't have to define your future. 
He then, um, well, the two of us and Mary Robinson, we had to go and speak at an event, which was a little bit intimidating. I spoke first. He sat on the platform behind me making um, rude, not rude jokes, but jokes and laughing and all that sort of stuff, um, which is a little bit off-putting. But when he got up, he said these words. There were moments visiting XLP you felt being tugged on the heartstrings. You were very close to tears, looking at these young people who could have been going down a cul-de-sac. But then they realized what incredible potential they had when given the chance to blossom. Each one of these kids is a masterpiece. God doesn't create rubbish. Each one of us is special to God. Your name is engraved on his hands. Some of us look like accidents. The most important thing you can do is to remind someone they're special to God. Just before he left, he took this one kid's hand. And I don't know if there's always a kid in your youth group who's like, please God, anyone else but that kid. But he took his hand and he said, I'll tell you what you are. You are a VSP, very special person. You're made in the image of God. You have the potential to change this world. And you know, the amazing thing was, you know, the kid, um, he didn't become a Christian. It wasn't one of those sort of stories you often hear on stages. Um, but he did get his hair cut. He did work out his CV. He did go around the estate going, Desmond Tutu talk to me. And he was chuffed. But it was a moment. You are a VSP. I mean, to be honest, some of the other kids didn't even know who Desmond Tutu was. But one of them said at the end, you know, it was really nice for Trevor McDonald to come down and to help us out. And, uh, but the interesting thing was, is me and Desmond Tutu, we had a, a very limited time on our own. And uh, he turned to me and he said, Patrick, the one thing you need to remember in life is this. You make God smile. Now, I've told this story quite a few times. And I remember for years, I lied when I told the story. You're like, oh my goodness, we knew it. Switch off, press pause. Um, I lied. I said that Desmond Tutu said XLP make God smile. The reality is, he didn't say that. But I couldn't accept the fact that maybe I could make God smile. And, um, and that was tough. And I realized that actually I needed to say sorry for that because I couldn't accept it. But the reality is, is if you're going through a time at the moment and uh, it is tough and maybe it's depression that has been someone that you're struggling with or a friend struggling with, and don't get me wrong, you know, if you're trying to support a friend for this time, it's tough for you as well. In, in the book, When Faith Gets Shaken, my wife Diane, she wrote a chapter called Secondhand Smoke. And Secondhand Smoke told the story of her trying to care for me during a time when I was really depressed and going through all my leg operations and stuff. And she said, secondhand smoke can still kill you. And uh, she was really, really, really struggling. And uh, she went to the doctors, she got some anti-anxiety medication, and uh, she said one day, the only way she could cope, she went into her bedroom, it's my bedroom as well, and she said, um, God, I can't do this anymore. And you know that saying, there's always light at the end of the tunnel? And she felt there was no light. And uh, as she said, um, she felt God say, stop looking for light at the end of the tunnel and look around you now. Look at the love of your friends and your neighbors and your family. Take a look. Take a day at a time. And that was our strategy. We had to take a day at a time, sometimes an hour at a time. And you know what? In this time that we're in, for some of us, that is all we can do. We can take a day at a time. We can take an hour at a time. And we can't predict the future. Handling anxiety, handling this stuff is realizing that sometimes we have to accept uncertainty. We don't know, but what we do know is this. God promises never to leave us nor forsake us. He is there because you make God smile. You're flawsome. Listen to the voice of what God says. Psalm 100, uh, it, it talks about how we are loved. 139, that you are knitted together in your mother's womb. That you're cared for. He knows every single thought. He knows everything that you're going through. I've really enjoyed, um, hopefully, this being with you. I hope this session has been helpful. Um, tomorrow we're going to talk about perfectionism, um, you know, the standards that we set ourselves, um, which I think a lot of us are learning to lower those standards a bit, which is really tough for some. So please, please come to that. Um, again, 
mention a few resources. Um, I want to mention the Association of Christian Counselors. There's some slides coming up on your screen now. Um, if this is touched on some issues and you want to get some ongoing support, then I cannot recommend these guys high enough. Please, please take a photo of the screen. Um, make a note of these numbers that you can connect through people um, who can provide that help and support as well um, and do check out the Kintsugi Hope webpage. Um, I'm going to pray and uh, it feels a bit strange praying, I'm not going to lie, in an empty church but I am praying because I'm imagining uh, uh, hundreds of people sitting down around their computers and their TV screens and uh, I'm going to imagine you guys and I'm going to pray for you guys that God would be with you today. Father God, I thank you so much um, for everything that you're doing. I thank you that you love us, that you say that we are VSPs, very special people. And in this situation um, that we find ourselves in this country, I pray, God, that we would know the reality of what your word says. Lord, that we can't resist all the thoughts, but we can replace them with your word. We can replace them with scripture. We can replace them with what you say over us. And so, God, we do pray that you'd help us not to get on the train and uh, help us in this next season of our lives. Amen. God bless you.